So I was uh, born and raised in the city of Cairo in uh, Egypt. Uh, interesting upbringing, only child. Uh, I liked traveling, I liked, loved playing soccer and squash. Uh, I liked reading, I was good in math. Didn't know what I wanna do with the rest of my life till I became a teenager in the city of Cairo. Everything was fine. And then something drastic happened. As a teenager, my, uh, my dad got a job in a different city, city of Alexandria. And for those of you who have children who are teenagers, uh, the proposition of moving as a teenager to a completely different society where you have no friends, you don't know anybody, you have no relatives, in my case, no siblings either. It was a disaster. Uh, I was suicidal in every sense of the word. I, I didn't want to go. I, you don't want to even know. <laughs> but then, of course, I had to go. <laughs> and I did move to the city of Alexandria and nightmare. Uh, you know, first couple of months, didn't know why I moved, and life was not good. Tried to acclimate, and then out of nowhere, a very random event happened. My, my father, an engineer, civil engineer, had a business trip, and the business trip was to Tokyo, Japan. He invited me to go. I had a squash tournament. I was really big into, you know, playing squash and all. I didn't want to go. He goes, and uh, he gives me a call uh, from Tokyo talking about this machine that he saw in a store. Uh, I think he actually thought it was a typing machine that could record documents. He talked about it, I said, well, just bring it, you know, we'll play with it when you get back. This is the machine. <laughs> it took me a while actually to find that picture on the internet. This would be FX801 Casio machine. That machine came with him from Tokyo, and uh, again, I actually didn't know what it was. This is pre personal computers, you know, where I lived. I, I thought it was a machine that had this micro cassette and it also had this printer that you can maybe write documents and store them in some format on the micro cassette. And it came with an incredibly thick catalog. And I decided to actually read. And it turned to be a programmable computer in BASIC. At that time, the only languages out there were BASIC, Fortran, and COBOL. And I fell in love with that machine, literally. So this became Ted to me, you know, as opposed to, you know, Mark Wahlberg. I literally loved the machine. I did everything with it. I, you know, kept programming it night and day uh, to the extent that I placed an order for the most advanced version of it, you know, six months later, which is actually right here. Uh, this is again like 40 year old technology. Again, another programmable computer. This was basically the two events that resulted in me thinking that I should be a computer scientist, computer engineer. And lo and behold, it turned out that the only department that offered that major, because I was going to college in a year, uh, was actu actually in all of the Middle East, was the computer engineering department in the city of Alexandria that I hated going to in the first place. So I think the point that I'm trying to make is uh, life cannot be really scripted, right? And challenges might turn to be the best opportunities. Random chaotic events can happen that change basically the course of your life, hopefully to the better. Uh, but, but, but that's the point, point I think that I'm trying to make. That theme continued. You're looking at the city of Salt Lake City in, in Utah. During my college years, I came on a trip uh, to the US with a friend of mine a road trip, so our dream was to basically rent a car and drive through the US, all the way from New York to Los Angeles to Florida to San Francisco. And uh, we rented a car from an agency called rent a Rec, and the car was actually a wreck in every single way. As a matter of fact, I learned during one and a half months of driving that car across the US more about car mechanics than I've ever learned till now in the rest of my life. Going from, and I recall very vividly, from Denver to Los Angeles driving, uh, the car broke down, totally broke down, close to Salt Lake City. That we had no option but to actually stay in Salt Lake City, which we did not want to stay in, because there was nothing really to do in Salt Lake City from a tourism point of view. We had to stop because the radiator had to change, so we had to stop for a few days, and that few days, we had to, to, to stay in a hotel, walking around the streets, meet someone, and they invited us to visit with them at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. So we go to the University of Utah, 
I was at college at that time in Egypt and uh, roaming around and I saw a name, I, I s name was familiar, turned to be the person who more or less invented artificial intelligence. And he was a professor and this was the summer. So I thought, let me just go and say hi. I mean, this is an icon and this is the beginnings of AI. And I go and meet the gentleman who was the chair of the department. And uh, of course he looked at me as if he's looking at somebody from Mars. You know, I'm coming from 4,000 miles away saying hi and whatever. And then he looks at me, oh, do you know programming? I said, yeah, I do. Uh, do you know Lisp and Prolog? These were like languages that were just incipient in artificial intelligence. And I said, a little. That little was like half a percent, right? Like I knew, of their I knew they existed more or less. So he actually hired me because he needed summer workers. And of course I had plans to continue touring the US and so on, but I thought it was an amazing opportunity that just happened out of nowhere. Uh, and I worked there for actually a couple of months, published the research paper, did really good work with amazing colleagues at the department in artificial intelligence. And that was the reason I went to graduate school. Uh, simply because the car broke down in Salt Lake City. <laughs> I mean, that was the actual reason that that happened. Go back to Egypt and then decide to go to grad school and I apply to uh, universities. Um, I go to the American Culture Center in Alexandria and Cairo, actually. And at that time, University of Pennsylvania had an amazing artificial intelligence and robotics lab, and I apply. Uh, this is pre-internet, of course, so that was a very tedious, lots of paperwork kind of thing. I was told by the uh, advisor at the embassy that uh, University of Pennsylvania never accepted any student from the country of Egypt for the PhD program in any engineering discipline. And I applied. <laughs> And uh, I was accepted with a full scholarship to do a PhD. And, and, I, and I went, of course, amazing time at Penn. And a year into studying, I actually asked why was I accepted. And they said there were two reasons. Number one is that you graduated from this only one you know, department in the Middle East that offered computer engineering. And the second is your work that you did at the University of Utah. We thought that these two things were really worthwhile. Again, completely unscripted. Uh, challenges and or opportunities and taking them resulted in something cool. Again, didn't know what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Enjoyed, of course, working at Penn. Really didn't want to teach. I mean, that was not among my interests. I just loved doing research, coming up with cool gizmos like you see on this table and working with robots and so on. However, I was given a scholarship. It was initially a teaching scholarship. And I go and meet a uh, professor uh, whom I'm as I am assigned to for the teaching uh, assistantship. And the professor looks at me, I was like 20 years old. And he says, well, this is my tenure year. So I don't really have much time to teach this class. Uh, this particular semester. It was a computer organization class. Uh, so you will have to teach it. And of course, I've never taught anything in my life before. And this was a senior level class. I was a first year graduate student, uh, meaning I just took that class like a couple of months ago uh, in a completely different country. And uh, I actually thought of quitting. I mean, I was that scared. It was really, really bad. And I said, well, let me try something different. And I actually tried teaching the class. And actually, it was the coolest thing ever. I truly enjoyed teaching. <laughs> uh, I was learning, of course, with the students. But, uh, it was, but we always do that as professors, so there's nothing new there. And actually, that was the reason that I got interested in an academic career. So it's the sequence of fortunate or not so unfortunate uh, you know, incidents that result in cool things. Graduated, went back to Salt Lake City uh, as a professor. I was actually uh, recruited by the University of Utah in Salt Lake City uh, to manage a prototyping grant, a grant that basically crosses boundaries to create electromechanical systems and robots and, uh, and milling machines and such. And it was a very interdisciplinary project. I didn't even know what I'm doing, but it sounded like a very cool activity that can integrate various disciplines of engineering, and in some cases, mathematics and biology, biomechanics and so on. And that was most of my research when I was working at the University of Utah. And at that time, actually, it started occurring to me that this whole concept of getting out from your comfort zone 
you know, personally, professionally, and academically, extends to education to really do something exciting and big and interesting and useful for humanity, you have to transcend boundaries of various disciplines. And that was the prototyping activities I worked on at the University of Utah. So while I was at the University of Utah, I got a phone call from, from UB. And this is uh, my journey to the center of the earth, in this case, UB. And the call was uh, a call asking me to help, uh, help basically lead efforts in the School of Engineering as a faculty member to reinvigorate manufacturing and automation and robotics and connecting with industries within various engineering disciplines. I actually didn't know what Bridgeport is or was at all. The very first thing, this is again pre-internet, 95, maybe you know, little mosaic Netscape. So the capability of getting a phone call to be recruited and being able on the fly to Google to know who you're talking to was not even possible. So it was an issue actually. I actually thought Bridgeport was in Ohio for some weird reason. <laughs> and, I, and I did Google afterwards, years, years afterwards. It turned to be, there is a city called Bridgeport in Ohio. I have no idea how that factoid came to my mind. I mean, halfway, of course, through the phone conversation, pretending I knew everything about, you know, Bridgeport, you know, I understood where it was. But the bottom line is, the only thing that really occurred to me, other than, you know, being flattered to be recruited, was a Bridgeport machine. As a manufacturing and automation engineer, when you hear the word Bridgeport, the only thing that comes to your mind is Bridgeport machine, the very first milling machine ever invented, 1938, I think. Uh, so actually, I thought I'm coming to the mecca of engineering in the US. You know, this is Bridgeport, where manufacturing was invented, and milling, and so on. Completely untrue, of course. <laughs> so I did come. Um, it was a great opportunity. It was an incredible risk to come to try to build the program. Uh, but I think the rest is history. Uh, it was a great chance to do something uh, truly uh, exceptional. And again, um, as you can see, uh, the kind of work that we did was not really bounded by discipline. Yes, uh, we had programs and degrees and departments in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. And we grew many degree programs at the master's, PhD, and the bachelor's level in many traditional engineering and other areas. But it became obvious that to grow a small program to something really impactful and significant, you really have to transcend the boundaries uh, between the disciplines. So we did really cool things. Uh, we did a project on the robotic musicians, where we had lots of uh, uh, instruments that were you know, basically robots with many more degrees of freedom than a human. And that robotic band was on display at actually the Discovery Museum and it toured the US for a couple of years. Great work between engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and the uh, Department of Music. Lots of work on putting uh, robotics online. Uh, wonderful work between mechanical engineering and computer science. Actually, this university was the very first university that created a robot that was accessible and movable and usable from any place in the world. Uh, we used to call it uh, uh, Robi, R-O-B-I. It created lots of media attention. The point that I'm trying to make is, uh, as we progress, the current reality is that we are preparing students for job titles that don't exist. The whole idea of having boundaries between different disciplines uh, is, is fast disappearing. Uh, the education we provide should be very dynamic in nature, should be experiential, should be very interdisciplinary. We shouldn't really ignore everything we learn about disciplines. We have to have a depth of knowledge in one or more areas, but most importantly as educators, as students, as professionals of the future, to be able to actually address and uh, work in disciplines in the future, the kind of education we need has to be multidisciplinary. There has to be a, a breadth of knowledge in many different areas to be dispensed to our students in order to enable them to, be, uh, uh, to hold the careers of the future. 10 years ago, you would have never heard about the existence of a job called autonomous car engineer. That job title didn't exist. Uh, neither was there a job title called social media marketer. That job didn't exist. Data analytics specialist didn't exist. 
nanotechnologies didn't exist either. And again, 10 years from now, in another that talk, I'm sure there will be 100 more job titles that don't exist now that will be talked about. So I want to give you quickly a few examples of projects that are exciting that we have been working on. We worked on exciting projects at the interface of health sciences and engineering within the area of simulation for patient simulation for training doctors, doing things like robotic uh, mannequin patients, lots of work in biometrics, uh, mixing computer science, artificial intelligence for facial identification, lots of work in uh, autonomy, submarines that are autonomous under the sea, lots of work crossing the boundaries between various disciplines in areas like renewable energy and green engineering and such. And I think the point that I want to make again is it's extremely important to be able to transcend boundaries and to get education that can produce uh, future professionals in STEM areas and other areas. Lots of new directions are in play. One of the things that I want to briefly talk about is the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges. National Academy of Engineering came up with a list of challenges facing humanity in the 21st century, including things like clean water, reverse engineering the brain, and many other areas. Every single one of them is disciplinary. The lessons to learn are very simple. Uh, be bold, be adventurous, don't be afraid to take risks, and, and most importantly, uh, try to get out from your comfort, comfort zone, both professionally, academically, and that's the way to survive and do well in the future. Thank you very much.